Welcome to lecture number 6 of PH4105 Advanced Mathematical Physics. We are discussing differential geometry in this section and today's topic is one which is very very important especially for phases. Today we are going to discuss vectors. What they are, how they are defined in differential geometry and how do the various different notions of vectors that I hinted at at the end of the last lecture come together and end up meaning the same thing? Let me quickly remind you what these various definitions were. Of course, all of you are definitely familiar with the very first definition of vectors that we study, which is a vector is an object with a magnitude as well as a direction. Now, after a while, we start to see some gaps in this definition. For example, when we talk of rotations, rotations do have magnitude, they do have direction. But if you combine two rotations in opposite order, carry out R2 after R1 instead of R1 after R2, the resulting overall rotation may very well be different. And that is something which vectors don't behave like. So, at least at the high school level, we are often taught to think of vectors as something with magnitude and direction and which obeys the parallelogram law of addition. If you think about it a bit, this definition is somewhat circular. You are essentially saying a vector is something which behaves the way vectors do. However, at this stage, this is more or less the best you can do. But once we go over and start talking about manifolds where the geometry may be very different from the standard flat geometry of pen and paper or the blackboard, we begin to see that this definition is by no means adequate. Near the end of the last lecture, we talked about three versions of the definition of a vector. We have the geometer's version, which I am going to briefly touch upon at the beginning of today's lecture. Here we describe a vector basically as an equivalence class of curves. We will discuss the ramifications of this in detail in a later lecture. Today we will just give you a hint as to what this really means. Then we come to the definition which will take up most of our time in this lecture and perhaps the next one, the algebraist definition, which ultimately ends up saying that a vector is a linear functional defined at a point and goes on to imply that things like vector fields, where you have vectors defined at every point, can also be thought of like a differential operator. Now this sounds a bit crazy, so we will need some time to think clearly about what this really means. Finally, we have another version which most college students are familiar with, which is the physicist version of what a vector is. A vector is a bunch of numbers or more precisely a physical object described by a bunch of numbers that transform in a particular manner when you change coordinates. If you think about it, this also is somewhat unsatisfactory because it seems to say that a vector is something which behaves like a vector. We will see later on that the algebraic definition of a vector automatically gives you this transformation law between coordinates you don't really have to postulate that as part of the definition of a vector. Let us, however, try to get an understanding of this transformation law business starting from the very basic definition of a vector. A definition or a notion of a vector which actually does full justice to the meaning of the word. I am not sure how many of you are aware of this. But vector is essentially a Latin word which means carrier. Of course, anybody who has used the word vector in a biological context definitely knows what a vector is in this particular sense. After all, we talk about mosquitoes as being vectors for malaria and so on. Now, when we talk about a vector, in a physical sense, you also use the sense of a carrier in its most direct form as an object which carries a point to another point. 
For example, the vector AB is essentially a displacement which will carry you from the point A to the point B. Similarly, BC is going to carry you from point B to point C. And since the net effect of going from point A to point B and then on to point C via this AB followed by BC is the same as just going straight from point A to point C, we end up with our very famous rule for vector addition, at least our elementary school rule for vector addition, the triangle law. The third side of the triangle, when completed, essentially gives you the sum of the two vectors. AC vector is AB plus BC. Now, if you focus on the vector AB, notice that it's basically a line or an arrow, a directed arrow, which stretches from a point A to a point B. So, if you have a coordinate system set up, then point A and point B both will have coordinates x a y a z a for A, x b y b z b for B. And the vector AB from this picture will clearly have components given by xb minus xa for the x component, yb minus ya for the y component, and zb minus za for the z component. And that is why we write AB as xb minus xa i plus yb minus ya j plus zb minus za k hat. Why exactly are these unit vectors along the x, y and z direction called i, j and k is another story. It is a rather fascinating story and I have actually told it in a previous video. It has to do with the history of the origin of vectors, how they came about from quaternion. But that is going to take us too far afield. So let's turn back to the notion of vectors having components or being described by numbers, in this case by three numbers, xb minus xa, yb minus ya, and zb minus za, and try to understand how this leads to the notion of coordinate transformations causing components of a vector to change. Now, it is clear that these numbers xb, xa, yb, ya, zb, za, the coordinates for the two points a and b, depend on the particular coordinate system you choose. If you carry out a coordinate transformation, say a rotation of your coordinate system, then the coordinates of both the points A and B will change. So delta x, xb minus xa, which is the x component of our vector AB, will also change. So will delta y, so will delta z. And it is easy to see that as long as the x, y, z coordinates of both the points A and B change in identical manner, the way in which the components change will be exactly the same. So we will end up with our first coordinate transformation definition of a vector. A vector is simply a bunch of numbers, or rather an object described by a bunch of numbers, which change in exactly the same way the coordinates do when you carry out a coordinate transformation. However, a moment's thought will tell you that this is not really correct in general. This will work as long as the two sets of coordinates x a y a z a and x b y b z b transform in exactly the same manner. Of course, the new coordinates x prime a y prime a z prime a and x prime b y prime b z prime b will depend on the old ones but will depend on the old ones in exactly the same manner. This happens when the transformation of coordinates is linear. When the coordinate transformation carried out is not linear, the defining transformation of vector components have to become slightly more complicated. Now, we will not spend any more time describing this here for two reasons. One, I have already made a series of videos on tensors and one of the first videos of that actually has a detailed description of the way in which vectors change from this precise point of view. And that series includes discussion of what happens when you carry out a nonlinear transformation of coordinates. And the other reason is something I've already stressed. Once we get comfortable with the algebraic definition of the vector, the coordinate transformation rule for any coordinate transformation, linear or nonlinear, will follow as an automatic consequence of that. So we don't really have to spend too much time at this stage thinking about what that transformation law is all about.
If you are not interested in vectors in a general manifold but would want to know more about vectors, their kinds and things like tensors etc. You can always go and watch my other series of videos. I will give a link to that near the end of this particular lecture. Now, while the vectors that we have been talking about so far, AB, BC or AC, have all essentially carried one point straight into another point, we in physics are quite used to points moving not along straight lines but along curves. And even there, there is a nice vector which helps us understand the motion very, very nicely. I am not talking of the overall displacement, but rather something which is perhaps even more useful, the instantaneous velocity. Now, the notion of instantaneous velocity actually ties up rather nicely with a geometrical notion that we had learned in high school, that of the tangent to a curve. On the left, you have a curve which I have drawn in green. I have marked a particular point P on that curve and this orange straight line is a tangent to this green curve. The elementary high school definition of a tangent simply is that it is a straight line which touches the curve at least locally only at that point P and nowhere else, at least not in the immediate vicinity. Now notice that here the straight line has no sense of direction to it. You could think of the straight line as going from this direction to that or from that direction to this. Indeed, it has no sense of magnitude as well, being effectively an infinitely long straight line. But you all essentially know that the real utility of the tangent is that if you stay close enough to the point P, the curve looks very, very close to the tangent, at least, again, locally. And that idea is even better reflected in this notion when we think of the curve not as a set of points, but rather as a sequence of positions of a point particle. So this is very obvious to think about in physics. A point particle may be traveling along this trajectory and at any given instant you can ask what is the instantaneous velocity of that point particle. And that will of course be along the tangent to the curve at that point. But now it has a direction. After all, it does tell you which way the particle is moving, at least in that immediate infinitesimal interval of time. Also, it has a very defined magnitude. It will tell you how fast the particle is moving. In fact, a very familiar formula for the velocity tells you that the three components which it has in ordinary 3D space are nothing but the rates at which the coordinates x, y, z of the point particle changes as you move along the curve. In fact, the velocity at point P, there's the orange arrow that you have drawn here, and that's something which has components dx, dt, dy, dt, and dz, dt, but these derivatives have been evaluated at a particular point, the point P, which is, of course, given by its coordinates x, y, z. So the question is, how fast do the coordinates of a point on a curve change when you move along the curve? And the answer to that is in the velocity vector. At least the instantaneous value of the velocity vector at the point P tells you how fast do the coordinates of a point on a curve change when you move through that point along the curve. Now, a more general, at least an apparently more general question can be asked here. Instead of asking how fast do x, y, and z change, we can actually ask this question. How fast does a smooth function f of x, y, and z change when you move along the curve? And the answer to that is given by what is called the chain rule in calculus. 
rate at which a function of multiple variables change df dt is simply given by individual pieces. The first piece tells you how fast does f change because x is changing, that is del f del x, rate at which f changes with x and x alone changing. Of course, multiplied by how fast does x change with change in t and the two other similar terms. Note that del f del x, del f del y, del f del z, at least the values at the point p, are well defined objects the moment you know the function f. So, all you do is supply the curve, that is, supply the velocity vector along the curve, dx dt, dy dt, and dz dt, and you can find out the rate at which f changes. On the other hand, if the curve is given, then at the point p, dx dt, dy dt, dz dt are known. So, you can also think of this as a machine which when you give a smooth function f, returns to you this quantity df dt by carrying out this calculation. So, instead of having just knowledge about how fast x, y and z coordinates change as you move through the point p along the curve, here you are looking for knowledge about the rate of change of arbitrary smooth functions. This may look like a more general question to ask, but as you have seen right here, if you know the answer to this question, that is, how fast are the coordinates changing, you can figure out the answer to the red question, how fast does an arbitrary function f change. It is also easy to see that it works the other way around as well. If you had a machine which, given any smooth function f of x, y, and z, were able to tell you how fast will f change at the point p as you move along the curve. Of course, this machine will depend on the curve as well as on the point p. Then this machine can also answer how fast do the coordinates change. After all, x is a function of x, y, and z. So, if you had a machine which would work for every function f, you have a machine which will work for x. And answer, what is the first component or the x component of the velocity vector? Similarly, plug in y as a function, you get the y component. Plug in z coordinate as a function f, you get the z component of the velocity vector. So, in a sense, these two questions, though one looks like a more general version of the other, have exactly the same content. Answer one of these, you can answer the other one. And it is this second notion that we are stressing, the notion of a machine which fed a function f will give you a number which tells you how fast is that function changing at a particular point along a curve, which generalizes most naturally when you go over to other sets, not just R3, but some set which locally looks like Rn, that is, to some manifold. So, this actually is key to the algebraic definition of a vector. We are going to discuss that in some detail, but before that, let me quickly give you an inkling of what the geometer's definition of a vector would look like. To get a feeling for this definition, let us take a familiar example. Tangents to curves on the surface of a sphere. So here I have drawn a curve in black on the surface of a sphere, which goes through this point P, and at that point P we can think of a tangent vector to the curve. Now it is easy for us three-dimensional creatures to think about a tangent vector to a curve on the surface of a two-dimensional sphere, simply because to us the third dimension exists, and the fact that the tangent vector actually sticks out from outside the sphere and goes into the so-called third dimension should not bother us at all. However, an important question is, can we describe the tangent while sticking to the manifold itself without going out of it? And there is ample reason for doing that. If you are dealing with just the surface of a sphere or some other surface that you can embed in three dimensions, 
you can perhaps live without this refinement as long as those tangents stick out into the third dimension you can take them into account however you may have other kinds of surfaces which cannot be embedded in some small dimensional space you may have to deal with multiple dimensional space for example space with dimensions more than 3 in such cases thinking of the embedding dimension may actually not be a very nice thing to do it would be much much more powerful if we could talk about the tangent to a curve at a point without having to move out of that manifold so we already have a notion of what to do here from our high school definition of tangents remember as i said a tangent essentially is what a small piece of the curve looks like at least if you have a smooth curve in the immediate vicinity of a point the curve will look like a tangent so why not drop the idea of using lines which stick out of the manifold to represent vectors and just use a curve itself for the vector remembering of course only to consider a very small piece of it but there's only one problem with that there will be many many curves which go through the same point p on the manifold in this case on the surface of the sphere among them you will have curves with different tangent vectors but you will also have a huge class of curves which essentially are moving through that point at exactly the same rate so you can't really replace the notion of a tangent vector by a single curve and say okay just take a look at a small enough piece of the curve that's what the tangent looks like why pick out one curve among many possibilities the answer is you don't instead of picking out one particular curve to represent a tangent vector at a point you take a whole family of curves so what you really do is declare all of these curves which go through the same point p on your manifold and share the same tangent as equivalent you can easily check that this would become an equivalence relation in the standard algebraic sense of the word and once you have an equivalence relation that helps you to identify lots of different curves and treat them essentially as a single element that is is you're talking of the curves themselves you talk of the equivalence classes of the curves all of these curves taken together would form an equivalence class and that is essentially what the geometer's notion of a tangent vector is of course how exactly would you check that two curves are the same tangent vector is a slightly tricky question and we are going to talk about that in some detail when we talk about the geometer's definition at length later for the time being let me just end this preliminary account of the different versions of the definition of a vector by stating that here too you have another piece of terminology which actually would be very familiar to a biologist or even to a common person this equivalence class of curves is called a germ now a germ does not really mean something which makes you sick a germ actually means something that other things can grow from the verb germinate actually comes from the same root here the germ essentially is this teeny tiny piece of all of these curves which share the same tangent which are all within the manifold itself you are not sticking out of the manifold to get to them but which together carry the notion of a tangent vector at that particular point p notice so although we did take the help of a curve to define the tangent vector here ultimately it was not the tangent vector to a single curve but a whole equivalence class of curves together which represented the tangent vector for us and this notion of equivalence class is what plays a central role in the geometer's definition of a vector but now that we have got an overview of the whole thing it is now time to delve into these definitions at some more depth and as i've said in today's lecture and maybe a few lectures after that i am going to confine myself to what 
I have been calling the algebraized definition of a vector. In both the algebraized and the geometer's definition, the notion of a tangent to a curve plays a central role. So before we go any further, what we need to do is define exactly what a curve means in the context of differential geometry. As a physicist among you may be pleased to know that what a curve is in differential geometry is closer to the physicist's view of the thing, that is, not as a set of points on your manifold M, but as a succession of points which a moving point particle traces out. This will be clear from the definition of a curve in differential geometry. Given a smooth manifold M, a smooth curve on this manifold is actually defined to be a smooth map from an open subset I of the real line to M. Notice that the curve is not a collection of points on M, but really a map which maps points on I to points on M. It is a map and not the image of the map, which is the succession of points on the manifold, which we usually think of as a curve. So this is the first major change in mindset that you have to undergo. You have to realize that when we talk of curves in differential geometry, we do not mean lines that you draw on a surface of some manifold. Rather, what we are talking about are functions which map points on the real line to the points which make up these lines on the manifold. This is perhaps a great time to remind you that this picture of curves is great for a physicist. As we have said before, physicists tend to think of curves as tracks along which particles move. And it is the motion that is of interest to a physicist, not really the orbit, the points which a particle visits. This view from differential geometry of a curve as a map which takes points on R to points on the manifold is exactly a parallel to that one. Of course, the real numbers that serve as arguments to our curve are parameters. They do not have to mean anything specific, definitely not anything physical. But if you think of that parameter as time, and we usually call it T to remind us that that is essentially what is being meant, then this picture of a curve as the trajectory of a point particle becomes even more direct. And that is actually quite a useful thing to keep in mind. Note that while the definition says that I can be any open subset of R, the real line, but typically, and that's what the notation here also suggests, I is almost always an interval on the real line. That is why we are using the notation I for this. So the curve is this map which maps a point T to a point C of T. So this point T here gets mapped to C of T here. And as T ranges over this entire interval, C of T goes over the manifold and you get these bunch of points. So the orange line here, the stuff that we used to think of as a curve earlier, is actually nothing but the image of the interval I under the action of the curve map C. Let us now go over to the central theme of today's lecture, the tangent vector to a curve in differential geometry. Let me remind you that in the context of ordinary vectors in three dimensions, we have already seen that a tangent vector to a curve can be thought of not just as a bunch of three numbers or three components, which tell you how far the coordinates of a point particle changes as you move along the curve through its particular point. You can also think of it equivalently as a machine which takes in smooth functions of the coordinates and returns to you a number which tells you how fast that function is changing. We will see that it is exactly the second idea 
that of an object which takes in a function and returns a number denoting the rate of change of the function that is used to define a tangent vector in differential geometry. Here is a formal definition. The tangent vector to the curve C at the point C T0, where T0 of course is a point in the interval I, is denoted by C prime T0, that's a notation for the tangent vector, and is defined in the following manner. It is defined as a map from C infinity M, the collection of all smooth functions on M, to R, the real line. And the way you define it is, you specify exactly what it does to an arbitrary function taken from C infinity M. So you write down this as follows. C prime T0 acting on F is nothing but the rate at which the function C star F changes at the point T0. Let me remind you, C star F is a pullback of the function F to the domain of the map C, that is to I. So, the map C changes the function or pulls back the function on the manifold M to a function on an open interval of the real line. And so this is where you can do calculus in the standard high school sense of the word. C star F is nothing but a function from an interval of the real line to the real line. Of course, it's nothing but the composition F composes C. You first apply C to take a point on the real line I, that is a point T, to C of T, then you apply F on it. So you are really talking of the function F composite C acting on T and looking at how fast does this function change at T equal to T0. You must have noticed that I have written F with a square bracket here and not with the usual round bracket that we use for arguments of function. Note that C prime T0 is actually a function. It has a domain and a range, but it is a special kind of function or map. Because the domain here is a set of functions. So this is a special kind of map which maps functions to real numbers. And we have a special name for this kind of maps. We call them functionals. And it is standard practice in physics and mathematics to denote the argument of a functional with a square bracket. From elementary high school calculus you know that this derivative simply is a limit as t goes to t0 of the change in F composite C from T0 to T divided by the change in the argument itself, that is, divided by T minus T0. So C prime T0 is nothing but this machine which measures how fast the value of any smooth function F changes at C T0 when you move along the curve C. All you have to do is feed in the function and out comes the rate at which the function changes. Now, tangent vectors, as I've already said, will play a central role in the theory and definition of vectors in differential geometry. And these tangent vectors, as we have just seen, are functionals which act on a set, the set of all smooth functions on M, C infinity M. Now, as we discussed in our last lecture, C infinity M has a rather interesting algebraical structure. It is a ring. You can add functions, elements of C infinity M, and also multiply them. Let me remind you that C infinity M falls short of being a field simply because you cannot divide by a function which is zero at some point, which means division by all non-zero entities is not really allowed. Be that as it may, the ring structure of C infinity M is of immense importance and right now what we want to take a look at is the following. How does C prime T0 actually react to the ring structure of C infinity M? In other words, if you look at the operations which define the ring structure in C infinity M, 
how do these operations respond to C prime T0 acting on the functions? To answer that, let us begin with the simplest thing that you can do on a ring, which is add functions or actually multiply functions by real numbers and then add them. So, what does C prime T0 do to AF plus BG? This is straightforward from the formula. Remember, C prime T0 acting on a function F is nothing but the pullback of that function being differentiated and evaluated at T0. So, DGT of the pullback function C star AF plus BG has to be evaluated at T0. In the last lecture, we have already seen how the pullback responds or plays with these ring operations. C star of AF plus BG is simply A times C star F plus B times C star G. And now elementary calculus will tell you that this is nothing but A times DGT of C star F at T0 plus B times DGT of C star G at T0. And this, of course, is C prime T0 acting on the function F and this is C prime T0 acting on the function G. So C prime T0 acting on AF plus BG is A times C prime T0 acting on F plus B times C prime T0 acting on G. In other words, the linear structure of this ring of functions is preserved under C prime T0. Whether you linearly combine functions before you apply C prime T0 or you first apply C prime T0 and then do the same linear combination, you get the same result. This was rather simple. The response of a product of two functions to being acted upon by C prime T0 is actually slightly more complicated. Not only that, it is really the most important feature of tangent vectors. So let's see what that is going to be. And once again, this is very simple to derive from basic calculus. Look at the definition. C prime T0 acting on FG is nothing but the pullback C star FG differentiated with respect to T and the derivative evaluated at T0. But we have already seen again in the last lecture that C star acting on FG returns the product of C star F and C star G. So the pullback plays nicely with the product operation as well. So this is what you get. Now from elementary calculus, we know that when you differentiate the product of two functions, you are supposed to use what is called the Leibniz rule or the product rule for derivatives. So you take one of the functions, evaluate it at T0 and apply the derivative on the other and repeat with the roles of the two functions reversed. U dV dt plus V dU dt is a derivative dgt of uv, as you know. That's all that we have used here. So noting that C star f at t0 is nothing but f at c t0, and similarly C star g at t0 is g at c t0, we end up with the following. C prime t0 acting on a product of two functions is the value of the function at c t0. Remember, c t0 is the point at which c prime t0 is a tangent to the curve times c prime t0 acting on the second function plus g of c t0, the value of g at that point times c prime t0 acting on f. So this looks very much like the derivative formula back again. And it's not a surprise. It comes from the derivative formula. You evaluate the function at a point where the tangent is and multiply that by the result of the tangent vector acting on the second function and repeat with the two functions reversed. Now this interaction of C prime T0, the tangent vector to a curve with the ring structure of C infinity M inspires us to do what mathematicians do best, generalize. Notice the tangent vectors are definitely what we are after. But this particular tangent vector that we have talked about, C prime T0, is tied to a particular curve C. Can't we talk about tangent vectors without referring to a particular curve? Now that may sound a bit strange, because after all, we have been brought up to think of tangent vectors as tangent to curves, 
But as you will soon see, the generalization to a situation where we can talk about tangent vectors without talking about curves is pretty useful. The generalization is indeed quite straightforward. As we have seen, tangent vectors to curves are functionals, maps which may have functions on the manifold M to real numbers and they play in a particular way with the ring operations of C infinity M. We just preserve that and define a tangent vector VP. Notice that this is a tangent vector without reference to a particular curve it is tangent to, but it is a tangent vector at a particular point P of the manifold M, is defined to be a map. This is where the similarity with C prime T0 comes in. This is a map with domain C infinity M and range R, exactly the same as C prime T0. And in addition, you demand that this map VP satisfies the following conditions. Again, no prizes for guessing what the conditions are. They are exactly the way in which C prime T0 interacts with the ring structure of C infinity M applied to this particular case. So VP is a map which will act on the linear combination AF plus BG to produce A times VPF plus B times VPG and also it will act on the product FG, the other important operation in the ring to produce F of P times VPG plus G of P times VPF. This is an exact parallel to the way in which C prime T0 acts. Now because our definition of a tangent vector at a point P is a direct generalization of C prime T0 where the point P was C T0 in that case. It is a given fact that the collection of all tangent vectors to M at P cannot be empty since all tangent vectors at P for curves which go through P are definitely elements of this collection. So all the tangent vectors to curves that we have seen so far are automatically tangent vectors at a point. We will see later that actually this abstract tangent vector which looks like a generalization to the notion of tangent vectors to curves is really not much of a generalization because all abstract tangent vectors VP are also tangents to curves. But that will come later. What is more important for us right now is a special feature that this collection has. And indeed, this is the feature which justifies our name vector for these objects. And that feature is the following. The set of all tangent vectors at P belonging to M which we have already seen is non-empty, is, is called the tangent plane to M at P and denoted by TPM. If you are wondering about the nomenclature, just imagine all the tangent vectors sticking out from a point on the surface of a sphere. If you take the collection of all of them together, you definitely get what we would call a plane, a plane which touches the sphere at only that point P and hence the name tangent plane. Now, what is very important for us is the fact that TPM is not just any collection of objects. It has a special algebraic structure. It is a real linear vector space under the operations of addition and scalar multiplication. But now, you have to be careful. You have to define what addition and scalar multiplication means. And the meaning here is pretty straightforward. Remember, VP and WP are abstract maps which act on functions on M and produces real numbers. But the important thing is they produce real numbers and you can add and multiply real numbers. So for VP and WP belonging to TPM, two different tangent vectors to the manifold at the point P, we define VP plus WP as VP plus WP acting on F, an arbitrary function, is VP acting on F plus WP acting on F. 
Note that the right hand side is perfectly well defined because both of the objects which appear on the right hand side are real numbers and they can of course be added to each other. What about multiplication by a scalar? AVP, how do you define that where A is a real number? Well, you define that simply by the most obvious choice. You apply VP on F, you get a real number, you multiply that by A. Once again, what you are doing on the right hand side of this expression is perfectly legitimate because here A and VPF are both real numbers and you can definitely multiply them together. So, at least at this level, we can see that the operations VP plus WP addition of two vectors and A times VP, multiplication of a vector by a scalar, is very defined. But do these operations actually give you the power to convert TPM from just a collection of objects to a real linear vector space? To see that, what we need to do is check out the basic defining properties of a vector space and see that with the addition and multiplication by a scalar defined in this particular manner, all these properties are actually satisfied. But before we even start to do that, we have to check one thing. While the definition of VP plus WP and A times VP are very natural, at least they look very natural, what is the guarantee that the object that we get as a result is actually an element of TPM? That is, is actually a tangent vector at the point P. Now you might say that that's obvious. After all, VP plus WP as we have defined it acts on a function to produce a real number. So it definitely is a map from C infinity M to R. But remember that's not all a tangent vector at a point P to a manifold M is. It is a linear map. Not just any map, a linear map. And also it has to behave in a particular manner when it acts on products of functions. And to see whether that works out, let's take a look first at what happens when you feed a linear combination AF plus BG to VP plus WP. What we are trying to do is verify the claim that is written in green here, that is, these two elements, VP plus WP and AVP, are elements of TPM given that VP and WP are and A is a real number. So VP plus WP acting on AF plus BG is of course from the definition of addition of vectors VP acting on AF plus BG plus WP acting on AF plus BG and now from the linearity property which VP has VP remember is a tangent vector you must have A times VP AF plus B times VP G as VP of AF plus BG and similarly A times WP F plus B times WP of G as WP of AF plus BG. Now we collect together terms which have A in them that is we get A into VP F plus A into WP F here and collect together terms with B in them. And notice that VP plus WP acting on F is exactly this and VP plus WP acting on G is exactly this. So this definitely works out for a linear combination. So VP plus WP acting on a linear combination does return the linear combination of the results, which is one of the properties that a tangent vector has to obey. The second property it has to obey is what it does to a product of two functions. Now, once again, VP plus WP acting on FG is VP acting on FG plus WP acting on FG. Remember the derivative-like rule that tangent vectors are supposed to obey. Acting on a product, you get VP acting on F times G at P plus FP times VP at G. And a similar split occurs for WP acting on FG. And once again, if you collect together, the terms which have G of P multiplying them, you get VPF plus WPF here and VPG plus WPG gets multiplied by F of P. So rather trivially, we end up with 
VP plus WP acting on the product FG is VP plus WP acting on F times GP plus FP times VP plus WP acting on G. Exactly the property which tangent vectors are supposed to have. You can check that A times VP also has these two basic properties of a tangent vector by a simple calculation. In this context, let me warn you about something which is very different about these vectors on general manifolds from the standard 3D vectors that you are used to dealing with. In ordinary 3D, you can sometimes talk about things like this. You have a vector A here, another vector B here, and you want to add them together. What you do is almost without thinking, you move this vector from this point parallel to itself to this point and claim that because a vector has magnitude and direction and that's all it has, these two vectors are one and the same. Of course, you have to excuse the fact that my drawing skills have changed a straight vector into a bent arrow here, but I guess you know what I mean. And then, of course, what you do is apply the parallelogram law to add these two vectors. In other words, in 3D space, we think nothing about adding vectors which are acting at different points. In fact, the reason why we can think about doing that is we are used to moving vectors parallel to themselves all over the place. But if you give it a moment's thought, you will figure out that even in 3D space, moving a vector parallel to itself willy-nilly is not a great idea. After all, if you have, say, a physical object and you're applying a force to it at this point, moving the force to another point parallel to itself will definitely give an entirely different result. Now, in this context, we are often used to doing one thing. We are used to moving the force along its line of action, parallel to itself, while maintaining its length, of course. Now, even that works only as long as you are talking about rigid body motion. If this were not a rigid body, but a malleable one, Applying a force here, as opposed to applying a force here, would have two very different effects. So the fact that we have been trained to move vectors parallel to themselves, and thinking of them as the same vector, is really not something you should do. At least not without further justification. Indeed, transporting a vector from one point to another becomes a very big issue in differential geometry, and that is going to take up quite a lot of our time later on and will lead us to fascinating new topics like curvature. However, for the time being, let me just point out one very simple thing. Why can't you add vectors at two different points? And the answer to that simply is you can check whether VP plus WQ, where P and Q are two different points of M, is going to obey all the defining properties of a tangent vector. You would define VP plus WQ, obviously, in the same manner as before. VP plus WQ acting on a function f should give you VPF plus WQF. And this, of course, is a map which takes a function, returns a number. So it passes that test. What about linearity? You can easily check that VP plus WQ acting on AF plus BG you follow the defining properties carefully, will turn out to be A times VP plus WP acting on F plus B times VP plus WQ acting on G. Which means that this test also is passed by VP plus WQ. Where VP plus WQ falters is on its action on a product. So when you apply VP plus WQ on the product FG, of course you are doing VP acting on FG and WQ acting on FG and adding them together. Now VP acting on FG is F of P VP G plus VP F G of P. And a similar thing happens here. F of Q WQ G plus WQ F times G of Q. But notice what happens now. 
VPG and WQG have as their coefficients two different values, f of p and f of q. Unlike the case when you were adding two vectors at the same point, where this factor would have been f of p, this would also have been f of p, and you could have taken them common. You can no longer do that. So you see, vp plus wq does not satisfy the second important ring-related property that a tangent vector is supposed to satisfy. That should have been obvious anyway. After all, when you say vp acting on fg is f of p vpg plus g of p vpf, notice that the point p is stuck with the coefficients. If you were to take vp plus wq, you would be at a fix as to figure out which point is it where f and g should be evaluated. And the answer simply is that you can't. You cannot really add vectors at different points. And so, while the claim that we have made that the collection of all vectors at a particular point do form a vector space, Vectors at different points are not members of the same vector space. You can add or subtract vectors at a given point. You cannot really add or subtract vectors at different points. Now this has far-reaching consequences. After all, when you think of differentiating a vector field, which is something we do often in physics, you are actually trying to figure out how do the values of vector fields at two different points, which are vectors at two different points, really differ from each other. And as we have just seen, in the absence of any additional structure present on the manifold, this is something you simply cannot do. So differentiation of vector fields, for example, something which is natural to us in ordinary 3D space, requires additional structure to be carried out when we are on a manifold. And that will bring us to a whole new an important topic of parallel transport, but we are still a long way away from there. Let me point out one thing though. We have just stated that the collection of all tangent vectors at a point P form a vector space. We have not really proven that. The proof is straightforward. All you have to do is sit down and verify that all the basic defining properties of linear vector spaces hold here. I will leave that as an exercise for you to do. We still have a lot to study about these tangent vectors and their properties, and that is going to occupy us over maybe the next two lectures. For the time being, let me wrap it up today. See you again with further properties of tangent vectors in the next lecture. Bye till then.